Milk's face was fluorescent red from her blush as he slumped into the straight-back seat in the core briefing room, the bright pink bucket sitting in her lap not helping in the slightest. The fact the bucket had been used multiple times in the 30 minutes it took her to clean up her vomit, get out of her suit, and get to briefing, almost made it worse. Joel Matron Senwin stood silently in front of the assembled cadets, straight-backed and stern-faced, letting no hint that her armoured boots had to have stomach acid scrubbed off show in her stature. And then she spoke. The steady drawl that made Milk shiver in her seat, and caused hardened slackers to sit up just that bit straighter. Acceptable, she began, for first-time cadets who face their first enemy. If I ever see this type of flying again, I will drum you out of my academy. She pulled up a readout. Can someone here tell me what this is? She asks, gesturing at a nearby full gauge with various warning symbols near it. Ventures forth raised her hand. That's a static overcharge warning gauge, Drill Matron, she said, wincing as she realised what the instructor was driving at. That's correct, Cadet ventures confidently forth into great unknowns. Specifically the simulated gauge pulled from Cadet McDermott and Cadet Kennedy's interceptor after you fired your main gun without checking to make sure your allies were out of your line of fire. Cadet Slivers, what is the effective fighting capacity under 84.3% static capacity? The Nagri snapped to attention, trying to remember the particular phrasing of the book, before Semwin pushed onward, for the first time changing tone of voice to a menacing growl. Impeded, she said, before returning to her steady drawl. You killed your entire wing with a single shot. Congratulations, you almost made ace on friendly fighter craft. She then pulled up a three-dimensional render of that shot. The only reason the mission didn't fail instantly is because Cadet Kennedy had the wits to get out of your way when you announced you had a plan without informing them of the plan. She gave a final angry glare to the gunner before turning on the interceptor pilots, who finished back. And now, Cadets McDermott and Kennedy, your technical skill in flying is to be commended. I see your previous training has served you well. However, your choice to engage in a high G maneuver without consulting your fellow pilots shows you still need to learn. I understand you are used to chemical propellant and the gradual acceleration and top speeds they bring, but with gravity drives, your top speed is how many Gs you can take. In this simulation, your allies will be able to match any maneuvers you'd attempt. In real flight, if you attempted to pull that stunt, you'd lose half your wing because someone passed out or threw out from the strain. She gave a nod to Milk's queasy face and pink bucket. As proven by your WSO, and before you mention that this has never happened before, I've heard it before and it might even be true, but you're out of practice and your body hasn't adjusted to going under intense G-forces. No high G maneuvers until you're done with acclimating, understood? The class gave a call of I to the instructor's approval. Good. You have 10 minutes to get water and change, then you're all writing me a six page essay on how you fucked up. Dismissed. There was an electricity in Milk's body as she walked, a spring in her step that wasn't there previously, a glow. She wasn't marsh for showing these things, but flying like that? Into combat with the roar of a simulated engine and the punch of hard acceleration? It felt like coming home after a long day and being able to breathe. It felt like six years of stress melted off her shoulders when she heard the blare of missile lock. Flicking up the safety cap, on her firing controls and launching that missile in anger did more for her mood than hours of therapy. What did that say about her? Ivy McDermott looked in an alien mirror after slashing alien water onto her face and felt it trickle down into the stiff collar of her alien uniform. She was so far from her home it took a telescope to pick out which star was Sol. She did it once, even with the near impossibly material science letting her see planets as system over. She could barely see the light she lived her whole life in. Puts things in perspective, doesn't it, Ivine? Mean. She asked herself quietly. Whole world. Six billion people. Enough nukes to end it a hundred times over. Nations with hundreds of years of history. And I can't even see the world in a telescope. She scratched a bit at an old and faded scar running down her cheek, where a tracer from an AA gun had made its way through her cockpit and nearly set her face on fire. It didn't hurt anymore, but... Every time she smiled, the old tissue would pull, 
reminding her of that old wound. She was a small woman, 5'5 five five on a good day. She fit well behind the WSO panel of her old F-18. Everything in the interceptor feels too big, but she was able to adjust. She splashed more water on her face, washing away the faintest hint of tears in her eyes. She needed to be strong. Cookie was counting on her. He was the pilot, quiet, reserved, more likely to fold when pressed instead of doubling down. Everything she wasn't. Everything she could never be. But she saw how it hurt him, how people exploited that, how his family ripped up parts of his soul without even knowing. Oh, they knew and just didn't care, she muttered. In shul, she noticed. Huh. Guess I've started rambling in shul. Guess immersion works. One final splash of water on her face, more out of habit than necessity, as she pulled her red hair back into the standard tactical bun. She looked in the mirror and fixed a grin on her face. An easy one, because she wasn't much suited to thinking these things over, and turned away from the false gleam of teeth and flesh, and towards the sound of twangy guitar and the smell of red vine. Our speed ebbed down and ebbed again as we turned for that K-class sun. But Kate and that kid went on together on that trip they both begun. Ah, half-blind Kate and Yon Sam Jones made a hell of an engineer. So turn down for a glass for such as they, and thank God we're sitting here. For space is wide, and good friends are too few. Yes, space is wide, and good friends are too few. It is said in regulation books and whispered warnings to officers that the biggest threat on a patrol voyage isn't the pirates or a wandering black hole, but bored shuttle jockeys and stress-out engineers. So when cadets found ways to slip decks of cars and created games between lessons with cars from every side of the galaxy, instructors smirked and turned around, letting them make up games and distractions. When someone smuggled in some alcohol, they might know of it, but that stuff was passed on by the medics to make sure every cadet can handle their booze. So when Cookie walked into the fab base with an armload of wood and metal wiring, and walked out with a crappy beta guitar, none of the instructors cared much. They simply made a note that, if the instrument worked well, he showed proper proficiency with a fabrication unit, and should be allocated bonus points for his fabrication class. Milk, on the other hand, was a bit more curious. Now I get why you want the guitar, she began. But I don't get why you're doing all this translating. Wouldn't it be easier to just leave the songs in English? Cookie nodded. Yeah, but this is Philk. Half the fun is getting a bunch of idiots to sing along. Milk conceded the point. Three weeks, two tests, five projects, and a metric boatload of stress later, the cadets were given a week-long mental health break, and given free reign of the facilities to de-stress. Cookie had gathered as many chucklefucks as he could find, and began teaching them songs out of Carmen Miranda's Ghost and Finity's End. And as Milk walked back into the meeting room turned open mic night, she couldn't complain. A rakiri with a harmonica, something Milk will never forget as long as she lived, stood on stage and blew an intro note as Cookie began to strum a jaunty rhythm on the makeshift. Kit bashed, beat to hell, beat to guitar, he made with an industrial grade fabricator as the makeshift band launched into a song. Space is long and dark and empty, quite a ways between friend and friend. The small crowd of cadets and instructors cheered a familiar song they heard before began to play, raising drinks of whatever they had on hand into the sky. As Milk sauntered over to the makeshift bar, she listened with half a near, as Cookie began to substitute the fake bars with real places and stories he's cajoled, overheard and bribed out of the instructors, a more spacer of the cadets. So, you had better got something hard for me, Milk said with a grin to the barkeep. Ventures 4 sends a grin back. You and I both know how much of a lightweight these perps are, she begins, using the human slur for shield to the groan and mocking jeer of those overhearing. Our skiers and humans need something stronger to get our engines roaring. Ain't that the truth? Well, sure lass what paint stripper you're passing over as bathed up liquor tonight, the McDermott said with a grin. I'm in the mood to wake up in someone else's pants. Fourth pulls the top off what looked like a paint can with a sly grin. You want a paint stripper, she says. 
I've got some if you're willing to swig it. A massive reptilian cadet being trained in advanced boarding walked past and snagged the pail of alcohol that caused everyone within 10 feet of it to wince at the harsh smell. Ventures forth pouted. Sport sport. But yeah, don't drink that. It's toxic to red bloods like us. I've got the actual booze down here. She then pulled out a bottle that, when opened, smelled like a freshly sanitized room. Milk whistled. Well, that'll do. She grabbed the bottle, took a swig, coughed up a lung and chased it down with another drink, and then wandered off to find someone to shamooze. Ventures 4 frowned. Gears are, by nature, light sleepers. They're fragile in a hostile ecosystem, so they wake up easily. Like when one of your bunkmates starts rolling over and quietly having a panic attack at three in the morning, and another bunkmate gets up and helps them center. The rumors going around school about the pair is that they're lovers, or brother and sister, or both. Ventures 4 thinks she's figured them out. Back home, the Gears knew of something called the binary pair problem, where two people have learned to lean on each other so well they act as a single unit. And then something traumatic happens and they begin to lean even harder on each other until it's less leaning and more holding on for dear life. Codependency issues, humans call it. Ventures forth looks between the pilot and WSO and decides then and there, in a dark room with twangy music and the smell of alcohol, that she would help them, no matter what. <laughs>